Okay, folks, so we are live and we are up and running. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to some of you. Okay, this is our final teaching on the mystery of salvation, part five. Okay, and tonight we're going to be addressing addre accepting that invitation, the free gift of salvation. Now that's going to be very short. So before I get into that, there is uh, something I want to cover that I just put out there. And for those of you who were commenting on my uh, Facebook pages to the question that I had put up there, and that question was, did Judas Iscariot lose his salvation when he betrayed Jesus and hung himself? And of course, as usual, I put scriptural support would be appreciated. Now, while I was doing these teachings, I was posting a lot of questions like that. And the whole purpose of it is the entire purpose as to why I did this teaching. And the idea was to get us thinking, come out of the traditional way of thinking and let our thinking be based on what the scripture says. All right? And that was quite challenging for some people during this teaching because, like I said, whenever you bring truth, tradition comes fully gloved to fight you. And there's no need to row. There's no need to debate. And I always say this. I am not here to debate because I'm learning also. Now, when I posed that question, I was seeking a specific scripture. And I got that scripture. I got that scripture. And my good friend out of Grand Cayman, Oliver Watler, yes, sir, you were the one that posted the scripture that brought an answer to the mystery. Okay, so now let me take it from the top. Now, of course, our last teaching, uh, I was talking about uh, the one save, always save thing, and can one lose their salvation? And I said, yes. I believe that. However, I said to you, though, that is inconclusive from this perspective, not from my perspective, because I'm saying that because there are others who could bring scripture that will seemingly say that one could never lose their salvation. So as a result of that, I just decided to squeeze in and ask my part four, but my intention is do an extensive teaching solely on could one lose their salvation or not. So we could get both sides of the fence. There was a lady, uh, I can't remember her name, and I so appreciate her. I had, let me see if I can find her while I'm talking to you. I She was posting a lot of scriptures on to prove that one cannot lose their salvation. And I was happy that she was putting it there. Because again, we are all here to learn. The whole purpose of this teaching and every teaching that I do is never to prove me being right or smarter than everybody else. Listen, I am about salvation. I am about securing my salvation, that of my family and others. And how do I do that? By teaching them the accurate scriptures. Now, it is difficult for most people to receive what I teach because again, they don't want to hear it, and they don't want to prove it. This is what I grew up knowing and was taught, and I don't care. I believe it. All right? So the story about Judas was very, very interesting. And again, Oliver Watler, he was, I don't know if somebody put it since him, but he put the scripture there to, to bring more clarity, in my opinion. So listen to this. So people said that Judas Iscariot went to hell. There are some who believe that and some who don't. Who don't. Now, to be honest with you, he did go. The evidence is overwhelming that he did, all right? Uh, one would say, well, he did not commit the, the unpardonable sin, which is blaspheming the Holy Ghost, right? Well, I always said to you that your behavior, consistently, consistently that is, is an extension of your belief. He, he, he literally gave up Jesus, right? But that ain't the angle I want to take it from. 
I'm going to take it from an angle where I'm going to get those who believe that once save, always save. And once you're safe, you're safe until Christ come, no matter what. I am not challenging you from the set, from the from the perspective to be right. My teachings are to get you to think, okay? Just like myself, I want to hear your comments. I want to hear your rebuttal because now it gives me more material to go and study to ensure that, okay, let me make sure I got this right. So let's go to Judas. So let's go with those who say, once save, always save. And the Bible describes Judas as the son of perdition, the son of damnation who will be eternally in torment, right? The Bible describes him, uh, uh, I can't remember everything to describe him as, okay? So let's quickly go to John 17 because I want to read this prayer with Jesus made, right? I really want you to listen to this, this prayer. Let me pull up here, John 17, here we go. Okay, John 17. Okay, and we're gonna begin from verse 11 to verse 12. This is Jesus speaking, okay? And I think this is his prayer. And it says, and now, beginning at verse 11 of John 17, and now I am no more in the world. This is Jesus speaking. But these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. He's talking about the disciples now. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, he's talking about the disciples, I kept them in thy name. I kept the disciples. Jesus said, I have kept the disciples, God, in your name. Okay? While I was, verse 12 of John 17, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but, or except, the twelve that you have given me, I have kept, none None of them have been lost except, <laughs> okay? None of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled, okay? So let's stop right there for a moment. And again, we're not here to show anybody up. We're not here to prove who is right and who is wrong. Remember the theme of my ministry I do not debate scripture. I believe in obeying it. So in order to obey it properly, I need to have a good understanding. Okay? So I'm trying to get a good understanding. Okay, so the Bible just made clear. Jesus himself, he said, God, I was able to maintain and sustain all 12 of the disciples save or accept one, the son of perdition. So that means that he would have lost his salvation. So. If he lost his salvation, being a part of the 12, let's, let's make it make sense. Did somebody recommend Judas Iscariot to Jesus Christ? No. Did someone give him a list to pick from? And they threw in a word and said, you need to pick Judas. No. Just how he picked every other disciple, he chose Judas. Didn't end there. Not only did he choose him, or chose him as a disciple. Watch this, he can take it to a different level. He made him an apostle. That being the case, I cannot see Jesus choosing an unsaved man, a man who has, will not repent, did not repent, and not only make him a disciple, but also make, made an, an, an unsaved, unbeliever, an apostle. That makes absolutely no sense to me. Zero sense. So I am convinced Judas Iscariot, when Christ chose this guy, he was a believer. I truly believe that. I believe he accepted the fact that, Jesus Christ, you are the Lord. Right? The Bible, I can't remember what scripture this, but it says that the devil entered Judas. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. So if the devil entered you, Mr. Judas, he wasn't always there. And it was only when he entered you, you made some decisions contrary to your beliefs. It brings us back to this. And I just want those who, and again, let me be clear, man. I, I, I am not into no controversy. I am not into no debate. I want to get us all thinking, including myself. I want to get us all thinking. I want to get us all thinking. Jesus, who knows the end from the beginning. Jesus, who knows everything. Okay? He knows everything. So when he pick this Judas character, all right, he is the son of God. Why would the Son of God make an ordain as a part of his 12 someone who did not believe, someone who did not accept him? This is the guy who don't believe. So, okay, fine. Even if you brought him in just so, but you ordained him to be an apostle. He was labeled as an apostle. He was labeled as a disciple. Let me show you the equivalent of that if you believe that. That's like, let's say I had my own church building, that is. And now I'm getting all of my ministers together and I'm, I'm choosing someone who I know this person is not a believer of Jesus Christ. They do not believe. And I want to make this person my assistant pastor. I'm going to make them the minister and now they're going to be my assistant pastor, even though I know they do not know they haven't accepted Jesus Christ. So let's go back. According to uh, John 17, 11 to 12, right? 11 to 12. In Jesus' prayer, he said, Father, I have kept and maintained and saved all of them except one, which would have been Judas, the son of perdition, meaning that he didn't make it with the 12. Judas then went, not only did he betray Jesus, he also went and hung himself, Right? So some of you, I was reading the comments, They were all of them were very interesting. I had to block one clown because, again, when you try to disrespect this platform, I introduce you to the ministry of block and delete. They are always active and ready, okay? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, anyway, Judas not only betrayed Jesus, Judas hung himself. Then there's a part in the scripture where he admitted what he did was wrong. There was a guilt, so much so that he ended his own life. So my question to one, those who subscribe to one save, always save, right? How is it that Jesus would say in John 17, 11 to 12, that he was able to keep all of the disciples except one. And if you say to me, but Kevin, that's easy. He was never saved. You making your situation even worse. Because what you're saying to me is that Christ picked an unsaved man and ordained him as disciple and apostle. Is that something we should follow, seeing that we are followers of Christ? When Christ gives us a ministry, are you saying we should go out there and pick people who are, don't, they don't have to be a part of the faith, and we could make them apostles and bishops. Or Judas was really saved at one point. He did attain salvation. However, while when you attain that salvation, you are not condemned, as we would have read in the scriptures, uh, John 3 and 18. You are not condemned. Not only that, you are now an inheritor of eternal life when you die. So he had the package, right? But Jesus said in John 17 verse 12 that this one I couldn't keep, meaning that what did he do? Or at what stage did he lose his salvation? Because clearly it is possible if Jesus said this one here, I couldn't keep him. I had him. He was a part of the 12. And to be a part of this 12, he had to, been, he had to know Jesus. So Kevin, what's your point? What are you trying to get up? My point is simply this, and I want to say this to everybody. Don't trifle, okay? Don't play when it comes to your salvation. Don't, don't go on the premises that once saved, always save, or I, once I was once I accepted Jesus, I could do whatever I want. Because I've saw I've I've seen in the Bible, 
I am sealed till the day of redemption and all these other things that you say, seeing or saying. When we haven't, like I'm doing right now, laying it out in context. Now, again, let me be clear. Based on what I see so far, using the example of Judas, it is quite clear that one can lose their salvation. And I will continue to study it, particularly coming up to do the whole series on it, because I I want to, I understand those who believe the one save, always save situation, you know. What I can grab a hold of, and I made it very clear in my last teaching, is to say one save, always save, is to basically say, I cannot get out of that deal. There's no way for me, to, like if I decide to accept Jesus, I, I, the heaven got a lock on me. I, even if I wanted to, if I choose that I don't want this salvation anymore, the one save, always save crew is telling me, buddy, it don't matter what you want no more. You are locked. You mean, even if I don't want Jesus, even if I curse the Lord and, and reject everything, God is going to still keep me? Because if that's the case, then why didn't he keep Judas? Why did he say Judas was the one I could not keep? Again, let me be clear, because I know the narrative changes. I am not seeking a debate. I will not debate you. I'm putting these things up there so everyone could give their sensible comments, okay? Even if it isn't backed by scripture. Why? Because if, if you are wise like me, you're going to go through those comments, especially the scripture, scriptural supported ones, and now go and research even what you don't believe. They're providing scripture for what they believe. Don't discount it. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I go and research it. Guess why? Because I'm not coming here in arrogance. I'm not coming here believing I'm right and you're wrong. I'm coming here to learn. Now, now why? Kevin, why are you? I've never seen you done this with any other teaching. Why are you so adamant about this one here? Because we're dealing with your soul. Remember I always tell you, you, you don't have a spare soul like you have a spare tire in your car. You got one soul. So that means if Kevin teaching you wrong and you follow Kevin, it, when you slide on the next side, there's no, oh God, Kevin, tell me this. <laughs> no, no, no. Or Kevin can say, well, God, I thought I was. So this is why I'm teaching you to have an open mind. Have an open mind. Yes, you could stick with your belief, but continue, continue learning. Continue uh, reading those other scriptures that would give the impression that you, no matter what you do, you secure. And, and that's that's very difficult to believe. So again, if one save, always save is your belief. From where I stand right now in this teaching, that is very much challenged based on the Judas Iscariot situation. Because I know what you're going to say. One save, always save crew. Kevin, clearly he was not saved. You know what? I agree with you. Again, if he was not saved, nobody forced Judas on Jesus. Nobody sent in Judas's resume and said, I think you should take him. And as the CEO of uh, Jerusalem and Co., I recommend him highly because he worked with me before. Jesus went looking for him and pick him. Not only did he pick him, he ordained him not only as a disciple, but also as an apostle. Again, are you suggesting to me, if I'm going to follow Jesus, that I must follow that pattern and say, hey, let me go out there and pick even unbelievers and ordain them as apostles and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though they are on their own demonic run? No, man. <laughs> mm -mm. You could never convince me. Again, I'm open, though. But right now, you can't convince me on that. I, it can't. So, so, so let's use... The fact that Judas, again, was saved. Let's say he was saved. At what point, this is the real question. We're talking about those now who believe that that one save, always save in the deal. Okay, good. At what point did he lose his salvation? And let me tell you, I'm asking you this because I read some of the comments and some of the comments was like, well, I don't think he lost his salvation when he betrayed Jesus, but most certainly 
when he killed himself. Mm, won't they be the same thing? In the sense that, see, and again, this is where we, again, this is why you gotta, you gotta unlearn some stuff. This, we may not realize it, but by default, we weigh sin. If I said to you right now, if I said, if I said, if I said, Tamika, tell me something. If you, if a person was to accept Jesus Christ right now, do you truly believe that they have eternal life in them? Yes. And I say, what if they die the minute they make that decision? Do you think they're going to heaven? Kevin, yes. So I say, what if they had an evil thought and die? Do you think they're going to heaven? They'll be like, well, the majority will say, well, no, I don't think so. I think they're still going to heaven. Now, an evil thought, let's say that, let me let me define the evil thought. Let's say that evil thought was a thought where they were having sex in their mind with somebody else's wife. And then now that I put more icing on the cake, they'd be like, well, uh, well, Kevin, I mean, he did accept Christ. And the Bible says that he does have eternal life. And like you said, God said he already knew, you know, so God is going to go according to his heart. Mm, now you're making sense. So your conclusion is if he or she was, if she was to, he or she was to die right after they accept Christ and had that evil thought, because God knew their heart was, hey, look, this person really believe in me. They're going to heaven. I would you want that. Okay, let me give you a different scenario. Let me give you a different scenario. Okay, let me give you a different, different scenario. Okay, so the same person, the same person, okay, they accepted Christ. Guess what? And uh, they, they physically, the next day, went and sleep with their neighbor's wife and had a massive heart attack. In the middle of an orgasm, I'll take it even deeper for you. So you think they're gone now. So this is what your brain does now. Whoa, let me bring in my scales again. Let me bring in my scales. Let me bring in my scales. Now, my scales are saying the physical act. Mm, now that's heavy because you actually caught and people know. And this go on headline. So that, that scale now, that scale, that scale, that scale. Now, let's go over here now. You said the guy just had a thought. Okay, well, that's just a thought. Hmm. See, the scale is unbalanced now. So you see why I say to you, don't let's go on our opinions. Don't let's go on what people told us. Let's go back to the basis of this, the basics of the scripture. What, how does the scripture outline it? Because that's what I got to go by. Because if, if I go by everybody's opinion, I will be like a yo-yo up and down. I got to go by and stick by the basic rules. Now, what are the basic rules, Kevin? Because in both cases, the person truly accepted Jesus Christ. One who was physically committing adultery or fornication and the one who just had it in their mind. Both died. One died in the ark. The one died with the thought in their head. So, Kevin, you telling me they went to heaven? I ain't telling you nothing. I tell you what the, what the scripture tell you. So, heaven to you, and this is why I was saying to you all along. See, you reduce salvation to sin. You believe that a poison, I don't think nobody's going to leave this earth as a perfect poison. You reduce it to sin. This is how Jesus reduces it. Jesus said, John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus. Okay, he sent Jesus, watch. That whosoever believed in him, believe in who? Jesus Christ. Whosoever believed in him, shall do what? Shall not perish. But what else will they have after they die? Eternal life with him. Verse 17 of John 3. He says, God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world, meaning to prove them to be guilty and now hit them with the sentence of eternal damnation. He says, no, he did not send him in the world to condemn the world. Listen, listen but that the world through him might be saved. But this is the bonus that I love. Now, but let's look at these two people again now, because you already weighed one going to hell and one going to heaven. The one who going to hell is the one who was caught in the physical act where CNN, Huffington Post, Fox News, ZNS, everybody saw them in the act. This guy had it in his head, in his mind. But both of them, in their heart, they truly believe and accepted Jesus Christ. So let's see what the Bible says. John 3 and 18. For they that believe shall not, shall not be condemned. Not they who have the biggest sin. Not they who have the least amount of sin. They 
that believe. They that believe shall not be condemned. Watch this now. But they that believe not is condemned already. So let's let's use, now that we have the basic, let's add another one to the scenario. So here you have the guy who accepted Jesus Christ, believe in his heart, confess in his mouth, baptized. Let's throw that in there. He baptized too. Got all of that. Had a sexual thought, having sex, not just with anyone, but with a married person in his mind. He died. Person number two, accepted Jesus Christ, accepted Jesus Christ, believe he's the son of God. But for whatever reason, went back to do his act, died doing it. The third person, uh huh, third person, sat down one day as a single person and saw this man wife passing while he, he was sitting in the park relaxing and saw this man and his wife passing. This man wife looked nice, shaped nice. And this guy who was unsafe sitting back there and just fantasizing him having a field on this guy's wife in his mind. Now, let's look at the rules. Out of those three there, based on the scripture. Don't tell me how you feel. Don't tell me what your church policy is. Because when we go to God, all of us are going to be judged from this only policy, which is the scriptures. Don't tell me sin is sin. That is very much correct. However, let's go back to the rules because the rules now distinguish the believer and the unbeliever and the consequences for both of them. So based on that scripture, out of the three scenarios I just gave you, which one will go to hell? I'm listening. Which one will go to hell? So our assessments, the guy who didn't accept Jesus, why Kevin? Because the Bible tells you why. Because this man didn't make the choice to accept Jesus, he is condemned already. So when he died, because he didn't accept Jesus, he going to hell. So let's, now did you say that, Kevin? Let's make it make sense. Did he go to hell because of his sin? Or did he go to hell because he did not believe? Uh -huh. See, we don't don't take me all over the place and we in sin and, and who sin and this sin. No, 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 don't take me there. Because the Bible says, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that makes us all equal in that department. So if we all sin, then what makes us unequal? The ones who believe Jesus Christ. The ones who have accepted him. The one from the heart. Yeah, they can mess up along the way. No human being, no human being that have accepted Jesus Christ did not sin after they do that. But that's not the qualifier. It is your belief. It is, you, you, listen, your belief speaks to the spiritual realm. It's not what you do, what you sin. Again, let me be clear. This is not to endorse, to encourage sin. By all means, Paul himself said it, that God forbid that you continue doing that. No. But if when you go to hell, let me be clear. You did not go to hell because you sin. No. Sinners are not in hell, but unbelievers are. Because if that's the case, let me tell you why. I, if that's the case, let me tell you how dangerous and how thin salvation is. If that's the case, if you're going to hell because of sin and not because of unbelief, everyone on this live right now, if you sin today, you risk going to hell. If you have a thought in your mind that is evil right now, even though you're saved, you risk right now if Christ come. If you die, you go straight to hell according to your understanding of that. As you can see, John 3 verse 18 makes it clear. I mean, you it gets no clearer than that. People go to hell because they did not believe. I'm trying to help you. If I'm wrong, then show me it. I listen. I am open. I am teachable. I I am not here. I will never ever. Even if I give that appearance, 
take it from me. That is not what I'm here to do. I am here so you could feel confident in your salvation, that you don't have to walk around saying you saved, but you don't feel safe. That's foolishness. Your, your, if you truly, listen to me, if you truly, truly, truly accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a, it's a progressive work. It's a progressive work. There's some days you can be on fire for God. There's some days you can be like, I wish I had done this a long time ago. And you want to you want be in the praise and worship. You want to start doing Sunday school. You want to start going now. You want to start teaching it. Then some days, because you're a human being, the devil will uppercut you from left field. And if you don't get back in the word immediately, he, he will do it in such a way that it'll be days where you become despondent, where you watch, watch, watch. I don't feel safe. Being saved is not a feeling. Being saved genuinely is a belief. Everything is about the belief system with Jesus. To be saved, he says, those who believe, number one, you are healing, be it unto you according to your belief. Everything about Jesus is about your belief of him. Jesus isn't saying, come here, Kevin, come here, come here. Uh, Give me the, the, the sin counter. You know, like how you have the cash counter? Give me the sin counter and give me those sins you weigh today. Let me put them in the counter. Brrr. Okay, Kevin, I see you. 365 million sins. Or, but God, all of that I do, Jesus. Well, you didn't do all physically, but some was in your mind. So uh, you, I, I'm going to have to renounce your salvation. You cannot have that no more because you, 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 uh, you, you think but sin too much and do too much. You could imagine that. That's why I tell you the church that I used to go to in my earlier years when they said, if you sin, you are never saved. So you got to come back and get saved again. And that's why I said you all the time. And I may sound jokingly, but it's the truth. So according to them, and based on my performance, I was saved over 5,000 times because every time I said a bad word, and I used to cuss a lot back then. So just coming out of the world, I know 10 minutes yet, and I practiced cussing all my life, and you think I can become this point for poison and no Christ number. So the minute my friend or somebody make me mad and I pop the F word at them, oh man, oh, gotta go back to the cross again. And really go not, not to the cross, but back then to the altar. So I had to wait till we go back to church again. And when they call altar call, I back up there again. Why? Because I don't understand that salvation has to do with my belief and not my sin. In fact, the purpose of salvation is to deal with my sin. That's what the boy possesses. So I was saved every, at least twice out of the week. <laughs> at least twice out of the week, I was back at the altar. All right? And I was up there, and the fella screaming in my ass, call on Jesus. Call. And I could hear him now. Call with the bad breath and all. Call on Jesus. He is near you. Call on him. And I call him, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, come into my heart again. Come, Jesus. Come. And, and you know, Jesus is so patient and loving. He was like, buddy, I never left you. You never renounced me. You never rejected me. You sent, like, even this hypocrite on the side of you telling you to call on me. He he should be here next to you if he truly believed that. <laughs> so, so at the end of the day, salvation isn't a game. Salvation isn't somebody's thought-up thing. And, and they they trying to amend what Jesus put there. Listen to what he said to you. John 3 and 16. God says, I've sent my son Jesus. This is the only sacrifice for your sin. This is the only way you can be redeemed. This is the only way you can be reconciled to God. He did, he did not say, I sent my son into the world to weigh the sins of everybody. To see who was able to perfect not sinning anymore. Now I'm going to accept them. You didn't read that. And stop putting things in there. And, and I, I, again, I'm speaking also to the unbelievers. Listen to me. Because I know what you have been told. I know you, because in your mind, I, I won't get it together like Kevin, man. I won't get it together like this favorite pastor I have. As if these people, once they got saved, they were perfect from that day forward. Whoever told you that is a... Either they're ignorant, and I can't, I, have, I can't even categorize them as ignorant. I have to categorize them as ignorant. <laughs> Think about it. 
I had a lady uh, said to me some time ago on my teaching, I think on my part one, and she said to me that we should not encourage people to sin or make it sound as if they could be saved and continue sin sinning because we can't strive to perfection. And that's what we should do because the Bible say, be ye perfect even as I am perfect and so on, right? Okay. And that's why I'm saying to you people, listen to learn. Don't listen to debate. Listen to learn and think about it. I And I wish she was to me face to face. So I could have asked her this one question. And the one question would have been this. I say, ma'am, you know what? You're probably right. And you've made a very, very uh, heavy statement. You said that we should strive to perfection to become perfect because it's achievable. Two questions I have for you. Number one, are you perfect yet? And more than like you probably tell me, no, and I get that. You're probably still walking it up. Okay, so name me, and I'm going to be very fair to you, ma'am, very fair. Name me one person that you are aware of that has reached the point of being sinless, according to the scripture that you read out of context, according to that scripture. Because from what I understand, when I accepted Jesus Christ, the mere fact that I am made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, I am perfect already. But not through what I do, but what he has already done. Play with me. If that's the perfection you're talking about, you better believe I am perfect. His righteousness made me perfect, despite. Do I still repent? Yes. Do I still strive to live right? Yes. Did I still renew my mind to those things by default could fall off of me? Absolutely. So when you make these statements to debate, you know you sound stupid, right? Because right there, you can't tell me one person. Tell me one person. And guess what? Don't just tell me only. I know a fella named John. John from back in the day. He was perfect. You better give me some footage. Give me some audio, visual. I need to see all kind of uh, uh, CCTV at every move he make. I need to see this brother even in the bathroom. I need to see everything. I need the scanners on his brain to see what he was thinking. Because everything I need to see as proof that it's a perfect human who was sinless. Show it to me. I will see it. I'm making no excuse for sin. Mm -mm, no way. What I want you to do is accept this awesome gift that Jesus Christ has given us by the name of salvation. It is a, it is a, it is a beautiful, reassuring gift that no matter how bad things get in this life, you have the assurance of this one thing. You are not condemned. You could be broke like the Ten Commandments. You could be dying from cancer. Your husband, wife left you. You caught them in the act with another person. Your children betray you. They fired you from the job because the majority of them lied on you. The hope and glory that you have is that no matter what man say or do to you, you could never be condemned as a true child of the living God. I don't care what your pastor, your bishop, your mother, your husband, wife, children. I don't care how they verbally condemn you, what they say or do. As far as the audience of heaven is concerned, if you have truly accepted Jesus Christ, he says, you are not condemned. No. Why? Simply because the law of sin and death, according to Romans 8 and 2, no longer is over your head. That has been removed by your permission to Jesus Christ. Christ, you have the right now to remove it. Why? When I accepted him. And when I accepted him, the law that superseded that law and kicked it out was the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made me free from the law of the spirit of, of sin and death. Play with me had nothing to do with me not sinning for that to happen. No. All he wanted, if you believe, Kevin, just believe. If you believe, Kevin, then let's take it from here. Believe, read my word, believe my word, do my word, and watch, Kevin, how you're going to lose that desire 
for fornication. Lose that desire for lying. Lose that desire for being a hypocrite by telling people you perfect and they're not. From being a hypocrite of judging everybody else. Keep following me and watch. So for me, like I told you before, in hindsight, when I look back all the way to 1996, May 17 to now, a transformed person, the things that I used to do, say, and think. I told you before my testimony, at one point, that lust spirit had me in such shackles, even as a believer. There were times when I felt I would never get over this. Keep praying. Keep fasting. Keep believing the scriptures. Keep do your best to do what the scripture says. And guess what? You're going to be faced with great opposition. You know why? Because Paul said it again. I find then a law. He's talking about himself who's the believer. That every time I as the believer set out to do the right things in life, evil is always present with me. He says, no longer I that do it, but that sin that dwelleth in my flesh. Remember the lady tell me, we could achieve perfection. But he's saying... There's sin in his flesh. Then he says in verse 23, however, he discovered another law that he served God with the inward man. He served God with the inward man while sin take advantage or use his flesh. And in another scripture, he says, now we need to modify the deeds of the flesh. And how do you do that? By again, immersing yourself in the word of God and doing what that word of God says. You are fighting spiritually when you do that because the enemy is, you can't see him, you can't hear him, but he's encouraging you. Look at that dirty book. Tell a lie. Do this. Do that. And all of this is against God. But the more you resist by following the rules, if you res if I submit to God first and I resist the devil, watch the rules, watch the law, do I have to chase the devil away? No. Do I have to rebuke the devil away? No. So what does the rule say? If I submit myself to God, okay? He says, if, if I submit my, if I submit myself to God, I can't remember the piece, but he says the devil will flee. So he's giving me the protocols to follow, to shed the, the mentality of the old man. See, the mentality of the old man didn't go when I got saved, and that is where you are being incorrectly taught. See, you believe that when you got saved, oh, I'm the perfect person. I'm never going to have a bad thought anymore. And that time you fight, and I'm not going to take this thought, and you go right back to what you used to do. And then what happened now? Boom, tradition come back in again. And what is tradition again, you ain't? You better go back to the altar, get saved again. You clown. Go back up there again, joker. So what people eventually do, like many of them, they give up. Can I tell you something? They never give up, you know. They think they give up. They didn't give up. They stopped doing what they're supposed to do. And what is that called again? That's called a backslidden condition. And what does that really mean? Does that really mean they lost their salvation? Mm -mm 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 -mm. See, because to lose your salvation, it means you have to reject. That's why I tell you. For those who say you to the, that for those that say you cannot lose your salvation, they are simultaneously saying that the Godhead are a bunch of bullies, meaning that they're only waiting for me to accept. And the minute I accept Jesus Christ, let me see you try to get out of this. I will knock you from every angle trying to come out of this. And the same people will say to you, but God gave us free will. Now, hold on now. Only snake I know have two tongues, and you're talking about two tongues. Now, make up your mind. Either you have free will or you don't. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. So, so the bottom line is this. Like Judas, I accept that this is Christ. I save. But you know what? I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I don't believe he's the Christ no more. And not only are these fellas offering me money. Oh, yeah. I, and what the Bible call him? The son of perdition. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, guess what, God? I was able to keep all 12 except the one, which was Judas, the son of perdition. So don't tell me you can't lose your salvation because we see it in living color right there. Because if, 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 if Judas did not lose his salvation, why was he called the son of perdition? He committed suicide. He, he, he betrayed Jesus. He stole from the treasury. What more proof do you need? Jesus, listen to what Jesus said. That's the only proof I need. God, I was able to keep all except one. That's all the proof that I need. That's it. I don't need nothing else. I don't need to hear nothing else. That's it. So if he said he was able to save 
the 11, the, the full 12 except one. So I must interpret that to mean Judas was included in the 11 too. So 11 plus 1 is 11 then. <laughs> I like that. That's some good maths. 11 plus 1 is 11. What was I thinking? I mean, come on, Kev. Right. 1 plus 1 is equal 11. Boom, there you go. 11 plus 11. 11 plus 1 is 11. Jesus said, God, I was able to keep all of them except one. So did... Judas make it in? Well, you tell me based on that statement. Was Judas saved? You tell me. Why would Jesus Christ pick a guy, bring him in the fold, ordain him as a disciple? He didn't end it. Let's give him some more titles. Ordain this unbeliever as an apostle. You could imagine that. He ordained the unbeliever as an apostle. He ordained the unbeliever as a disciple. Who is a disciple? One who following Christ. One who Christ has training to go there. Didn't Jesus say he sent them out there, the 12, to go there and to preach the gospel? Didn't Wasn't Judas a part of that? So he believed at some point. But I don't have to be convinced he believed if God, if Jesus would have ordained him as disciple and apostle. So with, with that proof in mind, how come Christ wasn't able to save him out of the 12 by Christ's own admission? Make me understand that. So again, what does this bring us back to? Not to a debate. No, no, no. God forbid. It brings us back to context. See, unlike some of you, I, I was always ready and able to unlearn some stuff. Now, let me look at the rules myself. Let me read the base. And I don't just want to read these one-liners. Let me start from the top. And guess what? Even when I started from the top and read the entire chapter, that still didn't give me enough. Guess why? Because when I started this chapter, again, some of you right now, when I started reading this chapter for full context of this one line I saw, when I started the chapter, the chapter started with therefore. So, Kevin, what that mean? Oh, that makes a big difference. Because therefore speaks of a continuation. So that means the scripture before that, there's something that was said over there. And now it's saying now because of what was said over there, therefore in the new chapter, now we get more context. So this is why I say to you, this is how I study. I am very, I'm a, listen, when I tell you, I, where are my books? I have Bible study books here, word study books etymology books, every type book to do with literature and the understanding of grammar, punctuation, I have it. Because I know everyone with the comma, the punctuation, all have a meaning. So I cannot take one verse, one verse, and create an entire doctrine out of it. Nonsense. I cannot look at the Holy Spirit seal the believer till the day of redemption and call that once save, always save. I'll be a nutcase. Imagine me going preaching all over the place. Ah, you save huh? until Christ come. Because Ephesians, blah, blah, blah. I didn't read the top. I didn't read the bottom. I didn't read the chapter before. I didn't read the chapter after. But I'm running around with a whole team behind me. Now, y'all believe me now because we can stick to this one line of radio. Forget that it says, therefore. Forget all the other scriptures that what we thought in this one line was the case, the other scripture says, no, 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 no. You're interpreting this wrong. You need context. And how do you get context again? We need pretext and we need post-text. And all of, that, all of that simply means I need to know what is the core of what is being said here? Who is saying it? Who is it being said to? Is it just for this group here alone? Like, Excuse me, like the tide? Was the tide, when it was introduced, was that introduced for the entire world? So you need context. Well, we don't really, well, as far as we can say, we hear it all our life that we have to pay the tide. Okay, but let's, let's look at the context then. So the context says, and let's go at the favorite scripture. You have robbed me. How have we robbed you? You've robbed me in tithe and offering. Okay. Boom. So he told you, one liner. You have robbed God, believer, and you need to pay the tithe. And if you don't pay it, you are cursed with a curse. Hmm, let's look at context. So we go back 
to the scripture before, okay? Chapter 2 of Malachi, beginning at verse 1. And it starts off, amazingly, this is why you need context, it says, O ye priests, these or this commandment is for you. So from this point forward, going straight into Malachi 3, who is he referring to? The priests. And why would he be referring to them? Because God told the priests, who was his hands and feet in the earth, that you will not own no land over there in the promised land. And in exchange for that, I will make your 11 brothers to give you a tithe from the harvest that they get. Okay? You will be getting the tithe. However, you priests, you wasn't carrying out the law. Okay? Not just in the tithe. You had them bringing unblemished sheep to the uh, ceremonial uh, rules and so on. So when we read in context, now we see why you was paying tithe from 1945 and just getting kibbles and bits. Why? Because you were getting what you sow, you will reap. You sow 10, you will get 10. Kevin, how come? Because in the New Testament, the new rules, what does it say? It says, now these are the new rules. The more you give, the more you'll get. The less you give, the less you'll get. So those who only gave 10% in tithe, but there were those who were giving to the poor, half their salary, whatever the case may be, getting blessed like nobody business. And guess what made it worse? The ones who was given to the poor don't even go to church. So the ones who was in church paying the tithe was trying to figure out, how could this be? How come the windows of heaven ain't open yet for me? Well, maybe because you were not a part of that group who was told to. context. Who? Why? Was this for the Hebrew people alone or was for the entirety of the body of Christ? Let's make it make sense. Make it make sense. So that's why for me, and, and let me be clear with you, I, I didn't get here overnight. This took a while because just like you, tradition had me in a headlock and I could and in fact, that's what brought my confusion because I know what I'm reading, but what I've been told all my life, this is causing it to be a challenge for me. It's really making, I, 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 it, could, it didn't make sense to me at all. I, I, I couldn't, this don't make sense. So again, I, then I tried it. I said, let me try the giving to the poor thing. Let me do that. This is new covenant rules. You give as your heart desire. So as the Holy Spirit led me, I gave. I gave, I gave. I gave, and people will write me, and they always tell people who just want to do it for the results. So, so how long did it take you after you finish your fast, you start getting money and paying off your place? How long it take you for to overcome lust? How long it take you to stop fornicating? Everybody, everybody want to put, want to, want to do God work, right? And you can tell they're not doing it from the heart. It's like they're they're doing it right now. Okay, now come on, God, now come on, now take this thing off of me. No, what I say to you, Christianity, salvation is progressive. There are days when you're going to feel like God has abandoned you. That's a part of the package. That's a part of the deal. But here is where the problem is, and that's why you feel that way. Because you have yet to come to the acceptance that salvation is a hard condition. What does that mean, Ewing? Salvation is all about me believing. Meaning that even though I don't see Mr. Jesus here, even though I don't see Mr. Holy Spirit, even though I don't see God, and right now the bank doesn't take my place, I live in, in my car, all of this stuff, but I am saved and I go to church and I pay the tithe and I do this. Why God allowing this to me? And he's saying, Kevin, I'm still here. It's a process. I'm preparing you. I'm chiseling you. And I'm grooming you. You don't understand it now. I expect you to appreciate it now. But I guarantee you, if you're patient enough and you, if you, if you walk it out, at the end of this journey right here, and where I've already predestined you to be, according to Romans 8 and 29, you're going to see that had you not go through this, you would mess up up the road right there. Stop rushing this process and take your time and be humble as we go through this together. How is it that whenever you broke, God ain't there for you? Uh, look like everybody over here succeeding except you. No, every, listen, we are all on the same path if we have accepted Jesus Christ, but we are all at different levels keep saying that to you so there are people right now you, well, let me let me let me give you the super revelation there are people right now right now right now in their home right now who have abandoned church right now and guess why they abandoned church because they went to churches 
where everybody had the power. Everybody had the Holy Ghost. Everybody was crip walking, moon walking, smurf cabbage patch, the prep, the works. And they sat there and never felt any of what they saw going on. To the point, they say, you know what? I cannot be saved. And so they abandoned church. But watch this. They never abandoned God. Because even while they're home, they're convicted. So they'll pick up their Bible and pray. And even times they'll say, Lord, I don't know what's going on with me. I feel so confused. I mean, Father, take me to a church. Take me, bring me a preacher. Someone who could give me understanding. Now, they're hypocrite church because they don't see them anymore. Oh, where, where Mary is? Child, I know. I think she backslide because you know when you don't come to church, you know what next. You know what next. They missing out on the Holy Ghost. They missing out on Jesus because Jesus only does be here in this church. He don't go nowhere else except right here. That's why we act like a pack of fools when we come here because he only does be here. Now, when we go out there with our hypocrite self, we live like the devil, but we come back here to be restored. Hypocrites. So there are a lot of you probably listening to me right now, right in your room right now. Kevin, I hear you. Well, let me give you some good news. You are safe. You've accepted Jesus Christ. You're in a backslidden condition, meaning that you allow the cares of this world, you've allowed people's opinion to make you believe that you do not have Jesus Christ in your heart. You do. Let me prove it to you. Even though you don't go to church no more, there are certain things you don't do no more. And there are certain things that you think twice that are evil before you do it. Why? Because there's evidence that the Holy Spirit is still with you, convicting you. Don't let nobody fool you. Let me be clear again with you, okay? Salvation isn't a sin condition in this sense. Salvation is a hard condition for you to accept the free gift of salvation of Jesus Christ, meaning that you are not condemned. Now, your salvation will deal with the sin which it has done because you are not a righteous one in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is saying to you right now, as I speak to you, listen, get up out of your bed, get on your knees and pray and seek me. When you're done, grab your Bible, open your Bible and start to read and let the Holy Spirit work through you. That's the kind of God we serve. Unlike these hypocrites, all of them and they're dancing their way straight to hell. Unlike them, you don't want to be, I see why the Bible says broad is the way that leads to hellfire. I, I, it's clear to me now. Because God is in, in heaven and saying, oh, look at Kevin. My, I see why I love Kevin. Nobody can boogie like Kevin on Sunday morning. Just look at Kevin. Let's look at Kevin doing the, the church cripple walk. Just look at him. Ah, there you go. He ain't he been no souls after 27 years of being saved. Nowhere near there. But look at him. Look at him. Nobody can smurf and cabbage. Look at him. Look, 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 look. Look at he up on the front there. Look, look, moonwalking. There you go. There you go, Michael Jackson. And he believe he's saved because he's doing all of that. My God. Just look at this. Just look at this. Go, Kevin. Go, Kevin. Go, Kevin. See, we, that's what they call save. Yeah. Sweat drench. Oh, but the Holy Ghost was, oh, the Holy Ghost was in here today. Oh, Jesus, boy. Oh, boy, Kevin, you should have been church. Yeah, and, and, and what I miss. Let me tell you something. The pastor was hot. Boy, the, it was hot today. Mm -hmm, it was hot. So what, what they preach? I don't know what they preach. Don't ask me no foolishness. But let me tell you one thing. It was luck here. Yeah. So who got saved today? See, that, that's why I don't like talk to you. Know. Every time I talk in sense to you, you will know who got saved, who got the Holy Spirit. And man, ain't about all of that, man. Sometimes it's just joy in the Lord. Oh, okay. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> I thought it was about salvation. <laughs> okay. Forgive me. It was about, what did you get? Crip walk? Okay, it was about the crip walk. Okay, maybe you could teach me that one these days. Hypocrite. Oh, boy. No, don't let nobody, con listen, I'm telling you this because the Bible say, not Kevin. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk, circle that word walk, because guess what it means? The word walk means that live, who walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So he, let me interpret that for you. What he's saying is that even though, because you're in Christ, even though you mess up, that is not where your heart is. I lied today. I commit adultery. I did something foolish but my heart is in there. My heart is in there. In fact, I'm guilty that I did it. So I'm not walking in my flesh. I'm walking in the spirit because guess what? My heart is towards God, even though I mess up over here. So he says, let, the doubt, let there therefore now be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Verse two says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What has it done for me that I couldn't do for myself? has made me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, the law of, of the life 
the Spirit of Jesus Christ has condemned sin in my flesh. So while I made mess up here and there, I repent. Father, forgive me. Kevin, let's go. I know why you hanging out here. Let's roll. But your church people. So let me see if I get this straight. You've been saved for five years. And we caught you in a lie. You cannot be saved. No, you got to go back to that altar. Well, if I got to go there, you must have got to build a house there and live there. <laughs> you see, when you don't know better, you take on salvation as a job. And that job is, I got to make sure I am perfect before God in the sense that I don't commit no sin. Well, then what is the purpose of his righteousness? Then I, I'm confused. See, you confuse me. What He, the Bible says, your righteousness, I think it's Isaiah 64 and 6. The, 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 average, the, the average human being righteousness at its best are as filthy rags. So what that simply means is that none of us could ever qualify, ever qualify to be reconciled back to God. Never. We could never achieve a point of sinlessness that God says, okay, Kevin, you finally did it. My, my Lord. No. So that's what he did. He said, okay, in order to redeem you, let me get someone who've never sinned in their life Never. From the beginning to the end. And that would have been Jesus. And he would become the sacrifice. And because he never sinned, the sacrifice is going to be exchanged now. His life for yours. So now that I accept Jesus, the sinless one, Christ said, okay, now you qualify for salvation. And it sounds like I strain you, but this, this is another example of the ignorance of people when they say, and I and I want you to get this in the context in which I'm saying it, it's not to berate them, but to show you the magnitude of their ignorance. When a person say, Kevin is my spiritual father, or whoever, Kevin, Kevin who commits sin, Kevin who didn't die for you, Kevin who didn't take a spear on his side. Kevin who didn't have no thorns on his head. Kevin who wasn't nailed to a cross. And you're putting him in the category of the one who gave his life in exchange for yours simply because he was sinless. And you play paying this joker more homage. A mere mortal sinning just like you. Got to repent just like you. So for me, I will die, but I will never in this life. Now you could do it. And I knock on those who do it, but I can tell you this. That spiritual father and mother garbage, don't ever bring that to me. I, I you know you, I know you hear me say this a lot. I say it because of what I'm teaching you right now. When I look at the sanctity of what Christ did, and I must put a mere model between me and Christ. Boy, you boy, you got more nerve than a tooth. You, you hear what you're saying to me? Oh, my spiritual mother, my spiritual father. And, and what's so spiritual about them that I'm not spiritual? You know, I have to go to my spiritual daddy to get permission to do, to do what? <laughs> Boy, Lord. <laughs> huh? You hear what you're saying? You're getting permission from the one who was sinless, who was the reason for you to be redeemed back to the father. You want no permission from him. I got to get it from spiritual what? Well, you all the smoke grass, you all sicky. Huh? Never. I don't care. You know how many friends I lost? All? I hope I lose more. I hope I, listen, I, I pray I lose more because you will never in this life get Kevin L.A. Ewing to call any human being a spiritual. And if you call me, you all know my day. You, the day you call me spiritual daddy. Don't, you don't got to worry with me no more. Hussein Bolt will be able to take lessons from me. How fast I will run from you. Never. I, I am not, I could never be worthy. I am a, I am a, I am a one, I am a person who sinned just like you. I got to repent just like you. I got to go to the same Jesus, just like you. So if you are in your friendship with me, let me tell you the fastest way to do that. Call me your spiritual father and you will see just how quick you will see. They will put you in the Guinness World Book of Records of how quick a friendship can end. 
Don't ever. Any one of my friends who know me will tell you that. I don't, I never believed in it. I never supported it. Mind you, I, when I in Rome, I do as the Romans do in this sense. If that's what y'all say, but then y'all talk about it. If this is your spiritual mother, but let me go sit over here. If that's your spiritual papa, let me go sit over here Tell y'all finish your spiritual conversation. But you will never bring me in that because I don't believe in it. I will never subscribe to it because it's an indictment to the cross of Jesus Christ. It's an insult. To me, it's equivalent to sticking up your, your middle finger at the cross because you're putting a human. The Bible says there's one mediator. Who's that? Your apostle. I didn't read that. Your pastor. I, I most definitely didn't read that. Who is this one mediator between you and God? Jesus the Christ. That's what I read. Now give me the Godhead again. Christ is the head of the church. Okay. And then the pastor. No, I didn't read that. The apostle. No, the bishop. No. What did you read? Uh, man. Oh, okay. So it's God, man. Then who else? The wife. And then who's the head of, sorry, is Christ the man, then the woman. Then who's the head of Christ? God. So again, make me understand because maybe I'm a heretic. So make me understand. Show me your Bible that says Christ, pastor, man, woman, then God is the head of Christ. Show it to me. Show me the scripture that says there is two mediators. No, man, don't get mad at me, buddy. Go get mad at you and your cult. Don't get mad at me. And again, I knock on you. If that's what you believe, I just show you how vehement I am about it. I don't subscribe to that. I don't believe in that. I will never believe in that. If, if there's one thing you want to, if there's one thing you want to hinder you in your spiritual walk, it's that same foolishness right there. And the reason why, I never really told you all the real reason why. Let me tell you the real reason why I always despise this. I have known, and I don't know them no more because of the same reason, great men and women better than me who could flip scripture break it down, scatter it, and bring it back together and make super, super convincing sense, but limited. Why are they limited, Kevin? Because they're jealous leaders who got them subscribing to that. They can't do the will of God. They could only do the will of their spiritual father or mother. Kevin, that ain't no true because guess what? God is speaking to the spiritual father. Really? Well, why would he have to speak through them to speak to them? When the scriptures in Hebrews say that when Jesus Christ died, the, 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 the petition was separated, meaning that there's no more priests and whatever to go inside of the temple and do these rituals and represent us for God. When the scripture says we now who've accepted Christ can come boldly before the throne of grace. So where does caveat come in whereby I have to go through this joker to get to Christ? No man, read your Bible. Read your Bible, man. You could get mad all you want. I don't care. And listen to me. You will continue to be. There's an embargo on your life because there's an idol in your life. Christ, you could come straight to him. Say no disrespect to the pastor. In fact, if he was a true pastor or true whatever, he will agree with you. He'll say, well, buddy, listen. Hey, that's what Christ said. And you, you hear that way. So I don't believe in that. And I believe in that. I don't believe in that because of the example I just gave you, but more so that Jesus Christ was the only sacrifice that pleased God. And because he was sinless, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin only to reconcile us back. He said, God, I'm going to go through all of this. Take the, I'm going to become a mere mortal. That's the first thing he did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a mere man. And take the shame, the guilt, the punishment, the, the embarrassment. For these humans, who ain't doing nothing for me, but I won't do this. How much we, the Godhead, love them that I'm willing to leave my majesty and come here for them. So now you see why, when you reject the free gift of salvation, you're putting the cross to a shame. When you put another human between you and God and then you label them as some spiritual clown, you're putting someone between you and God. Very simple. All right, so we're going to end with this. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 22 to verse 23. We're going to close right here. And this part of it is where we're dealing now with those who are still on the fence, the unbelievers. Uh, for those of you who are just coming on board, I would strongly suggest you go and watch from part 1 all the way. And this is not an exhaustive teaching. I'm sure in the future I will do even deeper teachings on this as I continue my studies. But most definitely, 
I'll be doing a series strictly on this one save, always save. And again, the purpose of it is taking it from both sides, not condemning anyone, but taking it from both sides. I'm sure just like myself, there are some out there who feel they have strong, strong points to support their claim. And I'm not knocking you. Let me be clear because I'm not a debater and I am not here to debate you. And if I see you taking that road, I'm going to discontinue my conversation with you. I'm here to learn. So let me tell you what learning means. Learning simply means that there's some things I may agree with and there's some things I may not. I don't have to shout at you. I don't have to overpower you with my voice. None of it. I just don't agree with it. Now let's move on to the next point. You may say, well, Kevin, I don't really believe in that. Fine. Okay, let's move on to the next point. If we choose to expand on it to try to bring greater clarity, fine. But I'm not here and you should not be here to force me to believe what you believe. Christ never forced me to receive the free gift of salvation. So I don't see where you get the right to force me or even me you. So that's what learning is about. We are all, again, if we've accepted Jesus Christ, we are all on one path, but we are different levels. Okay? So in Proverbs chapter 1, and right now I'm dedicating the balance of this teaching to the unbeliever. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to show you where you are right now as an unbeliever is a very, very dangerous spot to be in. Particularly what you yourself, you're witnessing. You're witnessing how time is moving by so fast. You're witnessing people who, in fact, just last night on uh, the television on the obituary channel, I saw a lady who I went to school with. We were in one class together. She was up on the obituary channel. I was, I was very shocked to see that. Uh, I've seen many people whom I've graduated with uh, already deceased. I'm sure you the same way. People whom you love, people who you you shared a lot with, people who you probably had kids with, and they 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 gone to eternity. They they all of this this thing about salvation and so on. Right now, let's just say hypothetically that they did not make it to heaven. All right, like I said to you before. Where they are right now in eternal torment, eternal torment isn't their greatest issue. Their greatest issue is that they had the opportunities not to be there. So this part of my message is strictly for the unbeliever. And the unbeliever would be the one who have yet to accept Jesus Christ. I remember when I was coming up as a believer, not a believer, sorry, when I wasn't saved as yet. And I even get confused because, like I said, I was saved 5,845 times and a half, right? <laughs> Based on what I was taught. But my real original original date was uh, May 17, 1996. Anyway, prior to that, I can remember many conversations with my cousins, with my friends, even when I was in high school. And I would always say, we would say, boy, you know, if I was to ever be in a car accident or if I was ever shot, you know, and I had my last breath, I would say, Lord, forgive me, right? And in hindsight, when I think about that, it's almost as if you're saying you outsmart God. Yeah, God, I live my life to the fullest. But right when that last minute come and I see there's no hope, okay, now I'm ready for you. You can come now. Come to my heart right now because I ain't about to go to no hell. I done fornicate, lie, cheat, and I enjoyed that. So, okay, let me. I finish with it now and only because I'm about to die. And that's how I used to think. And I would hear my friends saying that all the time. I had some friends who were killed instantly in an accident. Whether they had a time to say it or not, I don't know. But this is the part I want to get to in this final part. Not because at that time, when you'd have had many other opportunities, you say, Lord, Lord, he's going to accept you into his kingdom. Now, I want to be clear, and I'm going to show you the scripture, okay? There's a, there are people out there who believe they're smarter than God, and they believe they're going to wait till the very second. And let me tell you something. If any of you have ever experienced, how many of you have been in an aircraft before? And that aircraft had some tremendous turbulence. I remember one time we were going into Jamaica on Delta, and the plane literally dropped out of the sky. Like, where, where we was in that turbulence... That thing plunged like a couple hundred feet until it, you know, began to move. And everyone, all that gravity and everything, everyone there was screaming. I guess I was holding on to my seat right there. 
I tried to play tough because Deidre was right on the side of me, right? And she was clinging to me. And the adults who was in a terrible accident. And where things happened so quickly, because I was in a horrible accident, and it was like everything just happened instantaneously. If you are not a, a godly person, trust me, the Lord ain't even on your mind at that time. you just trying to grab all of your bearings and trying to figure out what's happening. To the point that even when everything comes to an end, you are in such shock, you don't know what's going on. My point is, while you may say, I can call on the Lord at that last moment, you're not sure of that. That's one scenario. The second, the real scenario is, would God really respond to you during that time? How are you, what guarantee that you have that God is going to say, after all the times I reach out to you, Kevin, after all the times I've sent so many people to you, after all the broadcasts you watch on television, after all of that, you rejected, I extended my hand, you rejected me. And now I'm looking at your heart again. And even though you're saying, Lord, I confess with my mouth, Kevin, guess what? I'm looking at your heart, and your heart don't really mean that. You're only doing that out of fear. I can't accept that. Now let's read the scripture. So in Proverbs chapter 1, beginning at verse 22, we can read all the way to verse 33. Solomon says, how long ye simple ones? Now word simple also mean foolish. How long will you simple ones or foolish one, will you love simplicity? How long will you love foolishness? How long would you play with your life, play with your only soul? How long were you letting the pleasures of life, the temporal pleasures of life distract you so much that you don't realize time is ticking away? Check this out. The last time I spoke to y'all on my last teaching, and remember the prayer, I prayed at the end. And I say, Father, I pray for those right now who are moments, who are hours away from death, who are days and so on, right? But I, I went back to the time when I said that. And I think that was like, was it after 12? Anyway, the next day, we had a murder here. During that same time I made that prayer. I say, Father God, I pray for that person who do not know you as Lord and Savior. You remember that? I say, that person who was about to slip from time to eternity in the next couple of minutes, in the next couple of hours. I also prayed, we had a, another murder where a, 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 a gentleman here, 35 year old, was shot to de death. His daughter was there in, the, in a vehicle, a truck. Gunman came and started shooting. She got hit also. She didn't die. Remember what I said, Father, I pray for that person who's spending their final moments with their loved ones. But I have no knowledge that by this time tomorrow, they will be deceased. Remember me praying that. So you see, friends, this ain't no game. All this debating about all this foolishness about Hebrew this and black and white this and, and all of this. Listen, forget all of that. Get the basics first. Get your soul right. Because at the end of the day, even if you were to win your arguments, what sense does that make? if you never secured your destiny? What sense does it make if it is true that the real Hebrews are not in Israel? Or the real, the, 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 those Israelites who in Israel are not the real ones? What sense would that make if I never accepted Jesus? What sense would it make that, guess what? Saturday is the true Sabbath. What sense would that make if I never accepted Jesus Christ? Tell me. Again, this is why I say to you, Kevin L.A. Ewing, if you come in to debate me, you must, they must see someone who look like me because you will never get that opportunity because I'm not interested in that. I am interested in getting it right, to do right and to teach it right. I'm not interested in being right. I'm interested in getting it right. So what does all of that mean? Tell me, make sense to me. What does all of that mean? At the end of the day, I could sit home and say, yeah, Kevin, you take that. I lick you up with those couple of scriptures. You come talking foolishness. Boom, heart attack. I died right there. Boom, gone. Didn't know God, but the guy was a great debater. Didn't know Christ, but he's good at the scriptures. Didn't know God, but when it come to quoting the scriptures verbatim, he had a, he had a down pack. What did that all mean? When the most important thing that you were supposed to do, you never did, and that was to accept Jesus Christ. Tell me.
So now you see what I'm saying to you. Debating people is foolishness. They're looking to be right. I don't care to be right. I want to do what is right. All right? So he says here, verse 22, he says, How long, you simple ones, meaning those who didn't accept Christ, or God, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorner, the word scorner, that means people who are proud and arrogant. And the scorner delight in their scorning, in their proudness. And fools, listen to this, hate knowledge. Verse 23. Turn you at my reproof. The word reproof means correction. So God says, turn at my corrections. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So the other day I said to you, does the spirit speak to sinners or only Christian? Well, this just answered your question right there. Because he's saying now he's pouring out his spirit. But who was he talking to? Well, let's look at the context. Let's go back from verse 22. He's talking to the unbeliever, the one who have not accepted God. So God is saying, I want to make this so easy for you. I'm going to make this so easy, simple. So verse 23 says, turn you at my correction. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Kevin, God, can do, yes. You think God have really, yes, I just told you about one just now. Remember I told you about the guy? He was verbatim, verbatim with the scriptures. Verbatim with, with quoting them. He believe in the Bible, but he ain't accept no Jesus yet. So he is the one now God is speaking about. I poured my spirit on him. I have made my word known unto him. But what he did is he wanted to go, oh, he want to be in a debating contest with everybody to show them that he know the scriptures and he is right, but he have yet to accept Jesus Christ. So verse 23 says, Turn you, you, Mr. Debater, who have yet to accept me, at my corrections. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Verse 24 of Proverbs 1. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man take note of it. But you have set at naught my counsel. In other words, you dismiss every time I spoke to you. Every time I convicted your heart to get it right, you dismiss it for every time. So he says, verse 24 of Proverbs 1, Because I have called and you refuse, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded it. But you have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Verse 26, I also, who is I? God. Now this is where it gets scary. I also, I God also, will laugh at your calamity, your destruction, your damnation. I, God, will mock when your fear cometh. Who oh, in this terrible accident, the plane about to crash right now. He says, I will mock you. I will laugh at you. Friends, I want you to hear this, you know. Listen, listen. This isn't a mere mortal saying they will mock you. This isn't a mere mortal saying they will laugh at you. This is the creator of heaven and earth saying, after I would have extended every form of grace to you, every opportunity to get right, because I saw your day of destruction was coming. I did everything within my power. I sent every preacher, every everyone. Every time you pick up that Bible, it turned to salvation. That wasn't by chance. Every time you turn your car radio on on the way to work, some preacher on, you turn it off. I was reaching out to you over and over. And you told your friends, boy, if the day ever come and I was to get in an accident or something bad was to happen to me and I know I wasn't going to live anymore, I would say, Lord, forgive me. But let's see what God can do in a situation like that. Verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear, fear of dying come. Verse 27, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, everything's going to happen quickly. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Y'all listen to this? Those of you who oh dare hear me and hear me well, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Listen to me here. You are not losing anything if you accept Christ right now. I know what you're going to say, Kevin. 
I, I, I lie too much. Kevin, I live with my boyfriend. Kevin, right now, right now I live with a woman. She ain't divorced yet, but I live with her. I, I hear all of that, my friend. We ain't worrying about those things right now. Remember what I said to you. Salvation is a heart. Let's get the heart sorted out. Let's get that sorted out. We can, we can, we can deal with those other stuff. Let's get that out. We need to get you righteous. We need to get that fixed because the devil will use that to distract you because he know next week is your day to die. And he's going to make you believe, well, it don't make no sense getting saved because you're here having sex with this married woman every night. Don't listen to this dude. Get your soul right. Let the Holy Spirit come in there because let him convict you and say, okay, now look. Get out. Go live with your mom. Go live with some. Leave this alone. Let the Holy Spirit now deal with you. But don't say, let me fix this first. Then I can let the Holy Spirit come in. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. If you could have done it on your own, then we didn't need salvation. We didn't need Jesus. So this, I don't care, Kevin. I hear you, but yes, I feel so guilty. I already had seven abortions. I was even pregnant for my daddy. In fact, I have a child for my daddy. And I hate him. Baby, I hear you. I hear you, man. But it's nothing I could do for you or God if you don't get it right. Accept him. See, the, the, the healing, the, the, the restoration. He said, I will restore you. All of that comes in the package. But the enemy is convincing you that you need to fix something first before you come to God. It don't work like that, man. It don't work that way. Any preacher tell you otherwise is a liar. It don't work. He, he say, come as you are. Come just the way you are. In fact, he like you like that. Come like that so we could do his, his work in you. Come. I don't care what you are, Kevin, if I leave. Kevin, listen to me carefully. I hear what you're saying, you know. And I believe you. But Kevin, listen to me. This man pay all the bills here. All right? He pay all the bills. My husband allows you. That's why I left him. I know I ain't living right. Kevin, I be guilty every day on this. But Kevin, if I, if, if, if I leave this man, Kevin, the bank can take my car. The bank can take this house, Kevin. I can't afford to lose it. I got a child in college. And fuck this, man. You're helping me. Baby, you don't listen to me, you know. I hear you. But let me tell you what I also hear when you tell me that. What you're saying is that God or Christ is not capable, capable enough to not only take over from him, from him, but do better. Your issue here is that you, you have a security problem. But I'm saying to you, when you leave that and accept, when you accept Christ, not only do you have eternal security, but God is going to make these things right in your life. But what I'm saying to you, don't say to me, Kevin, let me see if I could get my own apartment first. Kevin, let me see if I could leave him first and, and see if, it, no, right while you're there with him, Make it right right now. Make it right. And watch God. But Kevin, what if I do this and then I, I have sex with him tomorrow? You still missing it, you know. Well, you think the purpose of, of righteousness is? It is not for you to dwell in your sin. It's, God is more interested in pulling you out of this than you finding every excuse to stay in it. Let me continue. He goes on to say here, Let's go back from verse 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as a desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. But I will not, I will not. My question, I kind of preempted now, I was going to post as my next question. Will God reject someone who reached out for salvation? It would have been it would have been based on this right here. And I know the majority of you would have said, no way. If a person comes for salvation, no, definitely God will, will save them. Again, again, they don't read the Bible. They don't know. So, they, of course, they can say what they've been taught or what they think. God is saying here, this is in Kevin. Then shall they call upon me, verse 28. They shall call upon God in their distress. They shall call upon God in their fears. They shall call upon God because they know this is the end. They are in, in fear and anxiety and everything going at a million miles per hour. And the, 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 the ones who had some kind of sense say, oh, God help me. 
he said, again, if my pastor said this, that's fine. If my wife said this, that's fine. If my mommy said to me, Kevin, I ain't listening to you, that's fine. But when the God of the universe says he will not answer you, now, if that isn't dreadful enough to you, I don't know what is. Verse 28 again. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Seek me early simply means that when everything begins to break down on them, quickly they can say, okay, God, okay, God. Early they come in the game to say, okay, God, I ready now. He said, but they ain't going to find him. Verse 29. For that they hated knowledge. Like Kevin given them right now, and many others before Kevin. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They had a choice to make, but they didn't make it. Verse 30 of Proverbs 1. They would none of his counsel. They take none of his counsel. They despise all my reproof, all of my corrections. They, they put aside. Verse 31. Therefore, in other words, because of what they did previously, Therefore, mean well, this is what's going to happen. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their own way. I didn't want to leave the person because they were paying the rent. I didn't want to leave them because it was such a good lifestyle, even though it was a sinful one. God says, therefore, shall they eat of their eat the fruit of their own way, and be filled, uh huh, overflowing with their own devices and ideas and so on that they thought was right. Verse 32. For the turning away of the simple or the foolish, the one who didn't accept Christ, for the turning away of the simple shall slay them. Turning away meaning that I turn away from God's reaching out to me. God saying, Kevin, come on. Come on, Kevin. Time is short. Let's go. Come on. He says, for the turning away of the simple, the foolish, the one who didn't accept, shall slay or kill them. My rejecting God is going to bring my life to an end. And the prosperity of fools, remember fools and the simple mean the same, those who didn't accept God. And the prosperity of fools shall destroy them, meaning that they're doing good in life. Nice job, the works, partying, you name it, nice car, everything. He says their prosperity, because they don't have God, will destroy them. Verse 33. But whoso, talking to those who are not saved now, again, hearken unto me. Whoever will listen to me, God, shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Why, Mr. Ewing? Because they accepted the free gift of salvation as opposed to weighing sins. Sin is sin. We already come to that conclusion. But I keep telling you this. There is a major difference when an unbeliever sins, because they're condemned already. But when the believer mess up. See, let me put it this way. If a person is an unbeliever, he can't ask for forgiveness of his sin in the sense that he just finished having sex with somebody who he's not married to. And he say, okay, I did something wrong. God, forgive me. I don't work like that. To, for that to work, you need to qualify for that. Because again, it comes with a package. Qualification means I would have originally accepted Christ. Now, if I confess my sin, the only time you do a, a confession of sins to get Sins, I mean, forgiven is you have to first ask God to forgive you and to accept his forgiveness of salvation. Now I'm in the package plan. That when I sin, he says he is faithful and just to forgive me. But you can't be a sinner totally vehemently against accepting Jesus Christ. And then you to, you and some friends out one day and you pop a dirty word or say something, oh Lord, forgive me. You saying forgive me for when you haven't even accepted the free gift of salvation yet. That doesn't make no sense. So many of you have justified yourself. But one thing with me now, I'm always, I'm a spiritual person. I'm, I'm religious. Okay, what does that mean? Because if it does not mean you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're a religious spiritual clown. 
So all of these labels you give yourself, all of these jargon foolishness, if it does not entail, that mean, Kevin, when I say I'm spiritual, when I say I'm religious, what I'm saying to you, Kevin, is that I understand that Jesus Christ died for me, okay? And the only way I can be sinless in the sense of righteousness, he's the one who's made me righteous, then I accepted him. Because I've accepted him, he says, not only am I saved, but I will have eternal life with him. So not only am I secure here in this natural realm, but I'm doubly secure when I die and go into the spiritual realm. But I can't live how I want to live and then pretend to be righteous and spiritual because I say, as an unsaved person, when I do something wrong, yeah, I know I call them so-and-so, but I did say, Lord, forgive me. I mean, what more you want? <laughs> no, man, it don't work like that. No, for me to be a partaker of God to forgive me of the sins that I'm asking forgiveness for, I must first be in the body of Christ. I cannot be outside of the body of Christ and expect for God to forgive me, a hardened sinner. It don't work like that. And that's why I said salvation is a package. It comes with a, here, yeah, this is your package. And these, the package includes the benefits. So that's how that works. So don't tell me you, you spoke to the ancestors or you do this or that. What foolishness is this? No, 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 no. Except in Jesus Christ. So I would have just read to you Proverbs chapter 1, verses 22 to 33. The extent in which you're trifling with your life if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay? Now, I don't care what they say at your funeral when you die. And of course, your family want to be comforted. So, of course, the preachers will say stuff like, I know Johnny's in heaven right now looking down on us, you know? And then some of your friends who, who knew you and love you, they're going to say nice things about you. And most of them who know that you weren't saved, they're saying the nice things because some way, somehow, that's going to come for them to make them believe that you made it in. So they're going to say stuff like, well, you know, Tom was, Tom, Tom was a kind person, you know. And I must say, man, if Tom had two grapes, he will give you one. In fact, he will give you the two. And that's the kind of person that he was, you know. And, and Tom, anyone who knows Tom, Tom will give you the shirt off his back. Mm -hmm, okay. Tom, not when you call on Tom, he will leave whatever he's doing <laughs> and he will come help you. Okay, that's all beautiful. And I get you. That's human nature. Somebody you grew up with. It's your cousin, uncle, whatever. And, and I would be insensitive not to understand that. I get that. My friend, but hear me and hear me well. If Tom did not accept the free gift of salvation, this isn't what I want for Tom, you know. This is what the scripture says. John 3, 18. Those that accept the free or believe in Jesus, they are not condemned. Very clear. Those who did not condemn, and those who did not condemn, who, who, who did not, who are condemned because they didn't receive, fall under the umbrella of nice people. Fall under the umbrella of people who never fornicated. Fall under the umbrella of people who have never committed adultery. Fall under the umbrella of people who kept it themselves never spoke evil of other people. They had all of the attributes on the outside. Unfortunately, none of what I just said are the pre-qualifiers for salvation. Now you're beginning to see more and more salvation isn't whether or not I sin. Salvation is believing in the Son of God. I truly believe. And I now qualify of the free gift of salvation. Now, Jesus said, you are now the righteousness, not tomorrow, not day after tomorrow, not next week, not next year, right now. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit lives in me right now. Now, he's the one that's going to take it over from there, the comfort of. He's the one that's going to convict me when I'm doing wrong. Jesus says, now, in 1 John 1 and 9, now, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you of them and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, mainly because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, true Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have to worry. I don't have to go around anymore wondering if I was really safe. You know, I just, some lady listening to me right now, Kevin, I feel so condemned because I just had, this my second abortion in, in six months. You know, I feel so guilty. Well, you should. In the, if you save, you should be guilty. But I don't mean you're not safe. But Kevin, my church told me I committed murder and murders in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, plenty of things in the Ten Commandments. Now, those who are not safe should be worried. 
But Kevin, why? Because I commit abortion. I'm a Christian. That that ain't right. And they they they're sinners. No, it isn't right. But you're not condemned. And it also isn't right for you to continue in it. But again, I don't know. I clearly have to make this. They are condemned already. Watch this. Even if they didn't commit abortion. Let's just say they live a seemingly holy life, but they make it clear to you they never accepted Jesus. It see, again, if it was a matter of what I didn't do in terms of sin, then still nobody wouldn't have been saved because you mess up some way, somehow. If those who have Jesus find it difficult to live a sinful life, sinless life, what do you think about those who don't know him? So Christ is necessary. Christ is essential. It isn't a matter if we should get saved. We must be saved because everything about this life, excuse me, is temporary. You own absolutely nothing. Everything you are steward over. You know why? Because one day you're going to leave it here and years from now, other people will own it. And when I said, I only use years from now in this sense, that not only other people will own it, people who were never related to you. Your clothes, your jewelry, your, your in my case, your drone, somebody else can fly that <laughs> if it don't burn down in some house. So what are you holding on to? This is the point I'm getting at. What is it that you feel is so important that you don't want to give up in exchange for your soul? Make me understand that. Sex, you don't want to give up fornicating. You rather risk eternity and torment because you want to fornicate. And I think you understand what you've given up. I don't think you know the gravity of what you're saying to me. Kevin, I, I, I don't know. You're right, you don't know because I can't even see you contemplating, negotiating negotiating that your soul, your soul, which is the only thing that matters here. If you die, hell isn't you were pricked with a needle and then a couple minutes later, the pain gone. We are talking about perpetual, perpetual torment. The most egregious, unimaginable, relentless horror. Listen to this. A Christless. There's no love there. There's no. There's no mercy there. There's no compa There's none of that. And that's why I said in my last teaching, some people right now, people who are near to hell. This is heaven right now. But they have at least some control over something, some control over pain or whatever. This is heaven. This is heaven compared to where they're going. Believe me when I tell you that this is heaven. Right now they are experienced heaven right now, which will come to an end when they die. And now they will experience the torments of an eternal, the thing that they thought was just hocus pocus or Christians just getting their underwear in a bunch. They now realize this is real. But guess what? I can't change my mind no more. I can't call Kevin and say, Kevin, run me through that sinner's prayer no more. Now I'm being whipped with the fact mentally that the amount of opportunities that I had. And that 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 person who I say I love having sex with, they're now having sex with other people. I have no control over that. The things I was sacrificing my life for, those people and things moving on with other people and things and living their life while I am here in torment for eternity. And there's no way out. There's no convincing the God that there's no uh, appeals court that I could go to to appeal this verdict on my life. All of this I did. I have allowed the enemy to string me along, knowing that at age 34 I'll be dead, knowing at age 50, at age 60, at age 24, 19, whatever. I, I, he, he, this, this dude working over time to keep me distracted to keep me getting involved with poison after poison, giving me the run around, doing foolishness, time all along was ticking away. And he made me believe every morning I got up, I got another day ahead of me. Every day I, was, I thought I was guaranteed the next day. 
And out of nowhere, tragedy struck. And all over the news, Peter Johnson has just died in a tragic motorcycle accident, in a car accident, shot by accident, uh, whatever. And while everybody mourned for me, especially during the early part of it, crying and weeping, and the reality hit all of them that I'm never going to be there again. That too will die out. And years go by. You know, they used to put you up there on the memorial page every year. Even that withers away, that stop happening. Until you become just that, a memory. And for the most part, the only people that will really remember you is your mommy and daddy. And maybe your siblings. But as time goes on, life goes on. And they too will have their turn. So depending on the decision they make now, more than likely, if they make it like you, they will be right there in the eternal torment. So while a lot of here referencing you, I remember uh, whatever his name is, Johnson man, you know, blah, 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 just a talk, then they end with you. But you are existing right now in another place. Some, again, will want to debate, well, I don't think you go to hell right when you die. I think, you know, you're in purgatory or you just hanging around in the lobby of hell and tell God judge you. And yeah, I don't care to know none of that. You know why? Because at the end of the day, the Bible says to me, it is appointed unto me once to die and there is a judgment. Now, whether I in purgatory or hergatory, it don't matter. The fact of the matter is, get your soul right. This debating foolishness is not going to put you in heaven. Let me get my soul right. Now, let's talk about purgatory. But don't talk about purgatory and trying to be right and your soul ain't right. <laughs> that, that's ignorant. No, get it right. Get your soul right. That's all I say to you. Get your soul right. Get your soul right. It's very simple. Tell the Lord, Father, I have disappointed you. I've lied. I've cheated. I don't want to live this way no more. All my life I said, I can't be a Christian because it's too much work. It's too much I have to give up. But after listening to what Kevin said tonight, the truth is I ain't giving up nothing. In fact, I am inheriting something. Kevin also made me believe tonight, Father God, that you are my righteousness. Once I accept you sincerely in my heart, I am sealed until the day of redemption. Yeah, everything that you will ever do for me from that point forward is to ensure that I make heaven. So it isn't like you're, you're with a big stick waiting for me to mess up to whop me over the head. So now it's making sense to me. Now it is more appealing to me to give my life to you. Because I realize you did the majority of the work and all you want me to do is obey. All you want me to do is just, just come on, Kevin. And from what you said in your word, in Romans 8 and 29, you said that because you foreknew me, you have already predestined me. Meaning that because you already created me, even before I was born, you knew what you wanted and you've already made a future or destiny for me. You said because you foreknew me, you've also predestined me to do what? All along from the time you foreknew me to my destination, I, you said all along you were conforming me to the image of my son. So that means everything that I went through was chiseling and grooming me into the image of your son. Every divorce, every abortion, every whatever vile thing I've said, done or was done to me, it was all a part of you grooming me to where I was going. And it makes sense because now that I'm here and this role that I'm in, I could never effectively and successfully function here without those things happening to me. Joseph is a perfect example. God foreknew him that he would be the leader of not just the children of Israel, but even another nation, which would have been Egypt. Everything that that man went through was grooming him for leadership. His brothers were jealous of him, threw him in a pit. He was sold to the Egyptians. He became the head of Potiphar's house. He was the butler. The Bible says that the only thing Potiphar knew was the food on his table because Joseph took care of everything. His wife, who wanted to sleep with him, but Joseph, being a man of integrity, said, no way. So she said, yeah, well, I can cry rape. Well, guess what? They threw him into the prison. And what happened now? They make him in charge of the prison, a prisoner in charge of his fellow prisoners. Again, what's the theme here? Each hardship he went through, he was in leadership. Until the time come, the Bible says how Pharaoh had the dream and the, the, the guy who... Joseph had interpreted a dream through before. Say, I know this guy when I was in the prison. This guy good at dreams. And they called for him, clean him up and bring him on. Now his gift is about to make room for him after he would have interpreted the dream.
But the point I'm making here is that look, looking at what he went through, you'd be like, my God, this ain't right, man. This man is so innocent. Why are they doing this? See, it have nothing to do with him being innocent. It have everything, like I have been reiterating to you, to do with the will of God for your life. I have said to you on numerous occasions, if God said to you right now, listen, Susie, Susie, I'm going to make you the president of America. I'm going to make you the president of Jamaica, Trinidad, whatever. I'm going to make you a successful this or that. If God was to advance you there right now, your current way of thinking will destroy you and it. So how does God teach us? Okay, life. Let me let you live life. That's it. The punches in life, the betrayal, the embarrassment, the shame, the, the lying on you, all of that is chipping away the old you and allowing to be exposed the one who God has called to the destiny that he's put in place. That's why when Joseph had his dreams, the dreams only showed him the end, never in between. Because had he seen what his brothers would have done, had he seen the false accusation of rape? Had he seen those things? He'd say, okay, God, you know what? Keep your gift of being in charge of these people. I'm not interested in that. So this is where faith comes in. Even though I don't know where I'm headed, it don't matter, you know. I have Christ. See, that's the key right there. I have Jesus Christ. That's all I need. All I need is Christ. And you know, you know why that's all I need? Because he done promised me. He will never leave me nor forsake, forsake me. He have sent his Holy Spirit, okay? to convict me. He sent a spirit to lead me into all truth and to remind me of the things he said. He didn't end there. He said, I've given you the whole arm of God, Kevin, your helmet of salvation, your breastplate of righteousness, your shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the evil one, your sword, which is the living word of God, your belts of truth, and your shoe shod with the preparation of the peace. It didn't end there, Kevin. Psalms 91, 11 and 12. For I have given my angels charge over you to keep you in some of your ways. No, 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 no. All of my ways. That if I as much as dash my foot against the stone, these same angels who gather me, I didn't end there. To which of these angels had I said at any point? Uh, Hebrews 1 verses 11, 13 to 14. To which of these angels had I said at any point, sit here at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool? None of them. None of them I said it to. Instead, they are all, the angels are just ministering spirits, serving spirits to serve who though? Those who are heirs to salvation. And who would that be? Those of us who've accepted the free gift of salvation. It didn't end there. Hebrews said, there's a cloud of witnesses cheering me on. Go, Kevin. Don't give up. Go, go. Look at all of these things Christ has put in place for a sinner that was saved by grace, for a sinner who wasn't even worthy of the sacrifice of Christ. I hope you all listen to me tonight, yeah? I hope you all listen to me tonight. Don't ever take your Christian walk for a joke. Don't ever get caught up in church politics. Don't ever get caught up in all of this prophetic stuff and all of this other stuff and arguing and debating about days and weeks and genius. Don't ever. The most basic thing that you ought to be focused on is to ensure that your soul is secure through the true salvation. That is the most, that is the only most important thing. Because you could cover everything else and not have Christ and be fueled for hellfire. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wisdom and for your word. And Father God, my prayer is very specific tonight. I pray for those that do not know you as Lord and Savior. That is what this is all about. Those who do not know you. And when I say don't know you, Lord, they truly don't know you. Because there are some who think they know you and they don't know you. There are some who go according to religious jargons or their particular policies and so on. And they're whatever stuff for salvation, which have nothing to do with your requirement. It is my prayer that this lesson, this talk tonight, this discussion, and I truly believe it in my heart that it has perked the heart of many tonight, even those who thought they were safe or even they are safe. And it's really making them look at their salvation from a different perspective. And again, it has nothing to do with the sin in their life, but everything to do with their heart condition. It is the hard condition that is causing them to sin or not sin. So until they get that secured or fixed by salvation and through the scriptures, making practical the word of God, then they will forever be thinking they're saved one day and not saved the other day. They will ever feel like, well, let me might as well go to the club and party because, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, salvation is a hard condition. 
when God assess everyone, the first thing he's zooming in on, let me take a look at their heart. Let me see if they have their passport for eternity, for eternal life. And what would that be? That is going to be, did they accept Jesus Christ? Not how much sins they committed, not how big the sins were, not how small they were. Did you receive the free gift of salvation? Because it is clear. He has sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And they that receive the free gift of salvation are not condemned, but those who did not receive, those who did not receive salvation, they are condemned already. So it doesn't matter how much times they sin or when they sin, the mere fact that they did not accept Jesus Christ, they are condemned, even if they some way, somehow were capable or even able to stop sinning. The mere fact that they did not accept Jesus Christ, they are already condemned. Again, so clearly my works in terms of trying to be perfect and right cannot take me into heaven. And if that could, then this would be kind of weird because the truth is we wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't need salvation. So it is my prayer that those who don't who didn't understand the scriptures in terms of salvation, those who didn't understand the mystery of it, I pray that this teaching some way, somehow, these teachings would kind of educate and inform them and more so let your Holy Spirit perk their heart. I pray that you would give them the uh, the uh, might, might meaning the ability to be patient and listen to these teachings with their spirit, Father God, and that you would remove that hardened heart or, or erase or remove the hardness from their heart only so your Holy Spirit could penetrate to the point of conviction that they begin to surrender all. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice who are listening to this teaching now and who will listen this in the future, even when I'm not on the scene anymore, that these teachings, Father God, will really begin to penetrate that heart, that these teachings will convict them in such a way that no longer will they say, well, no longer will they hold on to sin in exchange for losing their one soul. The Bible says that what does it profit a man to gain the entire world but lose his only soul? I pray for, again, everyone that may be hours away from that, moments, moments, moments before this, this, this extraction take place, meaning their spirit and body, sorry, their spirit and soul is eradicated from their body, which is the official labeling of death. Before that happened, again, some may be moments. Some of them, tomorrow, this time, they will not exist in this material world. Father, it is those that we pray for right now who do not know you. We pray that you will send an intervention. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be armed with the spirit of conviction, that this poison, for whatever reason, no matter how vile and deep they are in sin, but something hit them like a ton of a ton of bricks and say, hey, you know what? For whatever reason, I need to get my life together. Let me go watch this Kevin Guy video. Let me go watch this other preach. Let me, I, Lord, I just need you to come into my heart right now. Father, let your ministering spirits begin to minister to them right now. Let them make that decision right there in their car, right there with their boyfriend or girlfriend, right there in the midst of their sin right now. Let that conviction come upon them and say, you know what? I cannot do this no more. I cannot live this way. I'm not comfortable. I feel like I should be doing more in life. I feel like I should be much further in the things of God. Why do I feel convicted? Why do I feel like I should be in church or, or praying or preaching or whatever? It is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Why am I having these dreams? Father, I pray, I pray that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, the spirit that you say will not only convict us, the believers, but to convict the world of sins. Let the spirit of God right now, right now, convict their heart to the point that they surrender all to you. I pray for that father, that mother, those children, sister, brother, uncle, I pray for those who feel like 
they have done so much evil in this world. They have destroyed so many people's lives. This may, they have made life so difficult for others that the devil have them to such a point of condemnation that they feel there is no way God will accept them. Father, I pray that you remove those evil, debilitating thoughts that the enemy is using as a final tool to keep them out of your kingdom. And let the spirit of the living God penetrate deep within their hearts to the point that they accept you as Lord and Savior. Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So folks, that is it for me. But before I go, I want to tell you these two short stories. The first one is, uh, I told you yesterday, they had a, in our capital city, they had two young men that were murdered. One was 16 and one was 17, right? And I was following up on the details of what took place. And it was said that they were at the back of, I don't know which one of their residents it was, but they weren't brothers, I don't believe. And the gunmen pulled their open fire and these guys running for their lives. Of course, these guys ran them down in a hail of bullets. But anyway, I heard one of the boys who died, one of his relatives, I think it was his aunt, said that he shared a dream. And this was so interesting to me. In fact, I commented on online. He shared a dream that he had. And he said, in this dream, he woke up and everybody was gone and only him was left. And he said he believed that it was the rapture. Everybody gone, but he was still here. He had that dream, I think, last week. Now the relative is here to relay that dream to us, but he's no longer here. Another one. There's a friend of mine, uh, his, his, uh, his wife, used to be a caretaker for this wealthy lady. And... Uh, Maybe she did some stuff on her time. She never shared it with him. Whatever she did, she felt that she was unworthy. Anyway, my friend one day said he, he went there to pick up his wife. And he was led to talk to her about the Lord and told her that she needed to get saved and so on. She was very much up in age. I think she was in a, almost 90. And he said to her, he said, uh, in my so-and-so, you know, why don't you accept Jesus? It's very easy to do, blah, blah, blah. And she looked him straight in his eyes. And she said to him, white lady, no, but not in a mean way. Because the way it was relayed to me, she said it like the things that she has done in life, God would never forgive her. She never accepted Christ. And it wasn't long, about a week or two later, she died. And to me, just telling you that story is heartbreaking because it is another, think about it, almost 90 years old, if not 90 90 years of work that the enemy did to secure that soul. And if she didn't do it, clearly he was successful. Don't let that be you. See, every time you turn, your heart becomes harder and harder and harder and harder to the point that you either feel God cannot rescue you anymore or even when your day of calamity come, he don't hear you anymore. Let this be the day that no matter what you have going on in your life, this is the day that I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I don't care. God will have to work it out after I've already done this. All right? So God bless you. Continue to pray for me as I pray for you. And you have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful night. God bless you.